that, give it up for Doug and Michelle. Oh, how did you do? I was going to mention what oh, too. Yeah. Just the you trees. The big I'm yeah. sorry. Just <laughs> they, they want to know. Right. Just because you're here, uh, I'm going to launch over the Fourth of July weekend, like a tree planting sale. So if you buy three trees, we'll plant it basically at half price. If you're thinking of trees at all, and it's for you all, just for you all, today only. The rest of the community gets to hear about it like tomorrow. So cherry pick off the best trees. If you need trees, it's a great deal. If not, so it's buy three trees. We'll plant the planting charge is half price. Basically, <coughs> the labor is free. You just gotta buy the mulch, the steaks, and the food is what it comes down to, which you need anyway. They'll go over that. But today only, tree sale, the day, a week early. So there you go. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody, and uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the premise of this class, is that most of us have learned to garden somewhere else, and now we live here, and so we're faced with a new environment, new challenges, and, and a lot of things that are different from wherever we first learned to garden. So we're going to talk about a lot of those points. We're going to talk about some tips and some products that we have here. And then we're going to talk with you and, and, uh, and talk, answer your questions and let the class head in that direction as well. So let me just mention briefly some of the main major points that make gardening different here. First of all, we have altitude, obviously. And we have sunshine that uh, in the afternoon can be really strong. And so you may see a tag on a plant here that says full sun. Sometimes you have to be cautious with that because full sun doesn't always mean this tag that was produced in Southern California that has taken into consideration the Prescott sun. Then we have, going along with the weather, we have hot, dry, very low humidity winds, which usually come down this way. It's a prevailing southwesterly wind so that a good part of the month of June this hot, dry wind is blowing, drying out your plants. There's no humidity. If you planted vegetables, a lot of the summer vegetables are tropical plants. They want some humidity. We can't get it to them. When the monsoons come, things really turn around for them and a lot of other plants. Soil. Our soil here is crummy. It's uh, <laughs> if you have any, you know, it could be uh, it could be clay, it could be caliche, or in my yard, it's mostly rock. A couple months ago, there was this nice British man here, and he was getting stuff, and we were talking about plants, and he was very distinguished looking, had white hair, and so I said to him, so I guess what you're telling me is that your soil's kind of crummy in your yard, right? He said, no, the soil of my yard is shitty. It's <laughs> 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 my language, but you know, he went right to the point. So we said, so we got mulch, we got potting soil, we have products that can help you with that. Then we have, uh, if you haven't been through a, a monsoon, I don't know where you folks are from, how long you've lived here. If you haven't been through a monsoon season, you're in for a treat. A couple of summers ago, Michelle and I were over there working on an aspen tree when the thunder, the lightning, and the sky just sort of opened up right over us. It's kind of a shock when it hits you like that. So we ran in here for cover, and within about five minutes, there was water running almost up to our ankles. So, and that, so sometimes, a monsoon storm can come through and drench everything, or sometimes it can just park over your neighborhood, and it can, you know, wash out yards, it can, you know, wash out parts of golf courses, and so on. <clears throat> Another problem we have around here, for, from a gardening point of view, is we have a lot of animals. We have deer, we have avelina, we have rabbits, we have moles. We have a whole class just on moles and gogers and what to do with them. But these animals are here and they're hungry and they have big families and they can come through your yard and really do a number on them. And if you have several of these, if you have both the deer and javelina, um, my condolences to you because you're, you're, you're gonna be in for a challenge. Doesn't mean that you can't <clears throat> deal with it. Ken has told us about having the electric fence uh, around the perimeter of the yard. You know, it's on a timer, so it goes on at night. And uh, when we first put it in, he put a little bait out there, some peanut butter on the fence, and the came 
and checked it out and got a shock and that was it. They never came back again. And so that uh, can sometimes be better than fences because I've had Havelina uproot a fence that I thought was protecting my vegetable garden. So animals. And then, um, what else? Oh, so, and then not only the, back to the soil, soil is a very high in, in alkaline pH scale. So if you're, that's why it's important to amend, not to mention all the other factors we talked about, but if you're growing acid loving plants like hydrangeas, camellias, or dodendrons, blueberries, you're going to need to add acid to your soil because the soils here are very alkaline. So I think that's kind of the overview for the points that we're going to touch. And I'll uh, turn it over to you, Michelle. Okay. Um, we just wanted to kind of go through kind of a calendar of events. Um, being uh, new to the area, um, our frost dates in, in this area is May 15th, which this year it ignored it completely. Uh, and then uh, usually our first frost is early October. Um, that's usually, we, we do this a lot um, because it, this year has been so strange, um, so wet, um, cold. Uh, so it's been a very unusual year. And we just heard the other day that even the monsoon season is going to be pushed back a little bit because of the, it's not warm enough for it to hit. Um, is what the weather people are saying. So uh, we to wait and see what happens uh, with that. Um, so typically your, your vegetable garden, all your tropical plants don't go in until after Mother's Day um, when you're planting. Um, with uh, planting trees and shrubs, you can plant pretty much any time of the year um, because we don't get, we don't freeze so deeply. Um, usually the soil doesn't freeze completely at all here. So you can plant, even in January, you can plant trees and shrubs. Um, so like Ken said, we do have a tree sale going on. This is a great time to get them in before the monsoon season comes um, because the humidity level goes up and they don't dry out as fast. So it's a great time to plant right now. Um, Hardiness zone um, kind of depends on where you're from. Uh, people down in Mayer are closer to an eight. Here in uh, Prescott proper, we're pretty much a seven. Um, further up Groom Creek, you're, you're closer to that six range. So kind of know where you're at with how cold you get. Um, the lower the number, the more, more cold hardy your uh, trees and shrubs are going to be. Um, the higher the number, the more heat they can take. So that's kind of how that hardiness zone works. Press it's an eight, you said? Uh, we're seven. seven. Yeah. What about um, the area? Um, we're kind of closer to the eight. I, I live in Dewey as well, and usually between here and there, the temperature goes up two or three degrees. Um, it's not huge by any means, but we are a little bit warmer. Um, we get a little, or stay a little bit warmer in the winter time too. I don't notice that cold there. It, it's pretty much the same as Prescott, and, and Prescott Valley is a little, maybe a degree, but it's, it's not significant enough to change your total zone. So what Michelle is talking about, when you look at a plant here, and especially if it's a Monrovia plant like this crab apple, it has a little tag on here which has a lot of useful information about how big is the plant going to be, is it, uh, is it evergreen, is it deciduous, and most important, uh, it's cold hardiness. And it'll have a number, a zone number, and then it'll also have temperature, like this says, minus 20 to minus 30, so we know that we're fine. Most of the trees and the perennials that we have down there, they are all fine as far as cold hardiness. Behind us, we have annuals and vegetables. We know they're not gonna make it through the winter. <clears throat> and so. Be cautious too if you read the Sunset Gardening Book, which is a great resource. It's got a, its own numbering system, which is different. These are you know, U.S. Department of Agricultural Culture numbers as far as hardiness zone. So <clears throat> most everything we bring in here is going to be fine as far as cold hardiness. But if you recall, 
this winter we had a couple mornings when they loose down to eight. So if the tag says <clears throat> 15 to 20, I would be cautious that if you have another cold winter, you might need to cover up your plant or something else could happen. But that's a consideration of when you're selecting the plant is to look at the, that information. Uh, while you're looking at uh, plants and shrubs, trees and stuff around here, um, we do like to experiment. So just because we have zone 8 plants doesn't necessarily that we're going to be so put it on the rock hard as long as it's as deep? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it, it'll, it'll definitely, it'll, once you start watering that soil, you'll, it'll go down. If you have a lot of heavy clay, it's always a good idea to put some gypsum down on there mm -hmm. as well, because that'll look like that. Just, uh, okay. awesome. Thank you. Another thing that you can do, let's say you, you're, you're going to get a tree and you decide it on a spot. <clears throat> Where you want to plant it. When you, if you dig that hole in advance before you're ready to put the tree in, uh, you can fill it with water, fill the hole with water, and by the next day it should have drained. Uh, if it doesn't, then you probably ought to select another spot because it means most likely you have poured inadequate drainage there and there's really no plant that's going to be happy there. Uh, and this, this can happen uh, in Prescott Valley, for example. My sister-in-law lives in Granville, and most of her trees and shrubs are doing beautifully, but there's one spot where the water will not drain. And so after a couple attempts, a few little attempts, I told her, Sue, the best thing to grow here is a boulder. Because <laughs> nothing else is going to shut off the emitter, bring in a boulder, plop it there, it'll look fine. But that uh, perk test, it's called, is uh, it's not a bad idea, especially if you're not sure, you're new to your yard, you're not sure about the quality of the soil and especially how it might drain. Because you want good drainage here. Sometimes we don't have them in our yards. Uh, the next thing, uh, after you plant, uh, uh, once you mix your mulch and your uh, natural soil, uh, you want a uh, side dress with the all-purpose fertilizer. Um, no matter when you plant, fertilizer is key to growing things here. Our, our soil has very little nutrients whatsoever. Um, what little it does because of our high pH level, it, it can't, the trees and shrubs can't intake it. Um, so extra food is very, very necessary. Um, and you'll be surprised at the results that you'll get when you feed regularly here. Um, 
Root and Grow is a stimulator uh, which we like to use. It, it cuts down on stress that the plant transplant shock, transplant shock that the plant goes through when we're digging in this higher temperature. Um, anytime you disturb the roots, you get a little bit of shock and stress. Um, so it's a great thing to do, um, usually about six weeks, every two weeks when you're planting and, and your, your shrub's going to take off uh, really well. And you said that was root and grow? Root and grow. So Ken told, a little bit, told us a little bit about the planting crew and <clears throat> I just want to give them a plug because I get feedback, customers come in and they'll buy plant some trees, then later on they'll come back and say, that planting crew was great, they helped out, they helped me program you know, my timer, they added some emitters and some lines, and they just they told me about how much for water, and then, <clears throat> then I hear the planting crew come back and they'll say, that lady was great, she brought us milk and brownies, and <laughs> everybody was happy, and so it, this is, uh, you know, I, the last time we did this class, there was a lady sitting right there, she said, so when your crew comes out, they just dig a hole in the ground, they throw the tree in there, right? I thought, thank you for asking that question. And I went on with this process of praising the planting guys because I hear it from the customers and I, and I believe it, well, they're hardworking guys. One other service, another little plug I'd like to make, is we offer another service that's called a, a garden consultation. And that is something where Michelle or I and some other very knowledgeable gardeners come out to your yard you know for about an hour maybe an hour and a half talk about what you might want to do especially if you're new to a yard new to the area some folks say I don't know what's growing here but how do I take care of it I'd like to do a facelift whatever it is you're looking for we can try and advise you and then you come back here we look at the plants we've discussed and if, and if you're interested then you could have a planting crew plant trees I wouldn't plant any of these trees here in my yard I tried it recently and I, you know, I hurt my back and I said, okay, never again. So anyway, that's just a little bit about some of the additional services. In addition to when you come here, you have knowledgeable people that make every effort to help you out and make sure that you choose the right plant and have a successful gardening experience. Um, so um, once you get the hole, you got the mulch, you got the fertilizer around, um, with our winds here, you definitely want to stake your trees. Um, typically a year is usually <coughs> enough. Um, however, if you are planting in June or even early May, I would actually let it go for two years. Just because a little extra hold while that wind is blowing will help your tree. Um, a little rocking is great, um, but you don't want the root ball to move or you're going to disrupt your roots every time the wind blows. So your, your tree will never take off if your tree is not staked. So that's a very important part of the procedure. Can I ask you a question about that? If the tree, like we've got some Arizona cypress and they blew over sideways and they were growing at an angle, if you stake them up, then will they continue to grow straight after that? So her question was is if the, the uh, the trees you weren't later. staked, um, if you can make a tree go back. Um, it kind of depends on how, how the roots have grown into the ground. Um, what I would do is slowly tie it off to the side that you want it to move and just keep, as it kind of starts moving up, you want to kind of tighten it up and then as it goes a little bit more, tighten it up a little bit more. You don't ever want to force a tree all the way back, but it, just take it a, a little at a time. Um, and when it's wet, when the root ball or system is wet, it'll move a little bit easier for you. But you, like I said, you don't want to move too far, too fast, or you, you're going to pull that root ball up too. And I had a flowering pear tree that started leaning to the right, and, and I called the folks who had landscaped the yard and said, how come you didn't stake this tree? And they said, oh, I guess we forgot. Well, let's give it a try. And so it, I think it was uh, almost a year afterwards, and we, we did the same thing, kind of slowly pulled it back. And after a while, the tree was straight up, and it was doing fine. 
because trees can just, you know, if you're in that path of the prevailing wind, it can blow over. So the answer is that can often work as long as you can, you can do it carefully. Yeah, so trees on the roof and grow. Um, we have a bunch of, uh, they're either poplars or cottonwoods. Um, and one of them had died, but another one um, started growing an offshoot. And I wanted to try to transplant that. Would that river grow help us with that transplant? Because, I mean, I, I'm not sure if we can actually do it, but. Her question was transplanting and if the root and grow will help, and yeah, it will. Um, the trick with transplanting is you really want to try to get as much of the root system as you possibly can and already have your hole sort of dug so you kind of know where it's going to go. Um, you don't want your roots to dry out at all in that you know, transportation process from one hole to the other. If your roots dry out, then your tree's going to die. So what we can, we'll be able to transplant if it's off of another tree, like if it's shooting off of another tree? If it's shooting out, there should be roots that are taking it that way. Mm -hmm. So if you cut it closer to the tree and, and or kind of dig it up and see where the roots are, you can do that. Um, as far as watering goes, you really want to know your system. Um, watering is very, very important here. And you don't actually have to water as often as you think you do. Um, I can't tell you how many people, oh, my drip system's running for an hour, okay? My first question is gonna be, how much water is that getting in that hour? Know how much, how your emitters are working, how, how many gallons are coming out. Um, because 30 minutes doesn't mean a thing to me. Um, you need to know exactly how much water your trees are getting. Um, so basically when we sell a tree or shrub, um, we kind of go with the size of the pot that the tree is in. So say we're planting this shrub, it's a three gallon shrub. Um, newly planted trees and shrubs are gonna get three gallons twice a week um, because you're keeping that root system going. We don't want it to dry out at all, um, but we don't want to overwater it either. So you want to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, trees in a 15 gallon bucket 15 gallons twice a week so watering is really really important what about a volunteer tree like i have two elms that just planted themselves do they need staking as well if they look relatively straight um her question was um volunteers that are kind of growing pretty straight if they're small they don't necessarily need stake because as they grow and, and as they get top heavy their, their trunk is going to grow with the tree itself so no if it's a real short one it doesn't need to be staked so the back to watering it's, it's sort of a moving target in a way because there's so many variables your soil your yard the type of plant its age, that kind of thing. And people come in here and they'll say, well, how much do I want of this? And it's difficult to give them an exact amount. Michelle's talked about a one gallon plant should get one gallon of water. A three, you know, five gallon tree should get five gallons of water, maybe once every 10 days or so. And there are all kinds of sort of rules of thumb that people go by, you know, the one, two, three rule, or a gallon for a shrub, and two for a bush, and three for a tree. Uh, there, it's something that you're going to have to uh, learn and learn your, uh, as Michelle said, you got to know, you know, just, okay, it runs for half an hour, but is it one little emitter or is it five big ones? This is really all very important. And more often than not, trees, especially evergreens, they suffer from too much water rather than a lack of water. Um, there was someone who came in here recently, showed me a picture of his blue spruce, and he said, this is turning brown, my tree's burning, turning brown, and I don't know what's happening, and I water it every day for five minutes. Oh. I said, well, that could be the problem right there. You're just trying to tell somebody politely, why don't you try every 10 days for one hour? And he kind of looked at me like I was a little crazy. I said, you're drowning that tree, and five minutes does only get you this far, and the roots are way down here. So you know, there's some common sense involved. When the planting crew comes out, you know, they'll get a sense for your soil. They'll know what the depth of the pot is, and they can, you know, have to get you off on a good start for water. Yes, ma'am. So, like, okay, a bigger pot, you go by the gallons, but like smaller plants, do you 
I mean, I can't imagine planting my flowers twice a week. I mean, she needs you like every other day. Or and and my, her, her question was the smaller, smaller plants and flowers, uh, how much are you going to water those? The smaller the plant is, probably the more often you're going to water those. Um, because they have a smaller root system, they're shallower in the ground. Um, so, like you said, it, it, you kind of have to know your yard, your garden, your elements, the wind, the sun. Um, you can actually have three holes and one is dying. Well, this hole might be in the full sun and these get a little bit more shade or maybe this is the last one on the emitter line, so he doesn't quite get the pressure that everybody else does, so he doesn't get as much. So there's a lot of different elements uh, on the watering. So keep an eye on it. There's signs that you can look for as far as watering issues. Unfortunately, a lot of the watering issues have the same signs. So yellowing leaves uh, can be too much or not enough. It kind of depends on where they're at. So Keep an eye on your water, be vigilant, and, and, and you'll be just fine. Fertilization. You want to talk about fertilization? Sure. I'm <laughs> standing. I'll be man. So this is this is our all-purpose fertilizer. It is a uh, slow-release organic product. It's mostly kind of seed meal and bird droppings. And it's a light, fluffy product. And it's something that you can use for everything in your yard. This is, for me, one of the beauties of this product because once every season or so, and we try and um, make this so that it's easy for us to remember. Easter is a good time to fertilize. And maybe the 4th of July. And maybe Halloween. And perhaps once in the winter, maybe New Year's Day. But whether you do three or four times, uh, you, everything in your yard should be fertilized because, frankly, there's very little organic matter. There's nothing for the trees, shrubs to live on because we have that crummy soil, which the British guy told me. And so, this this product, the way I like to use it is, I, I pour a whole bag into a bucket. I get a 20-pound bag, and then I just walk around. And if it's a tree, I give it three or four handfuls, and if it's a shrub. I give it two, and then with the vegetables and the flowers, I may give it one. I call this the Johnny Appleseed approach. If you want to be more precise, there is information here on uh, how many ounces per thickness of the trunk. And I looked at that and said, I don't feel like doing math in the garage. I want to fertilize and be done with it. So I can tell you that my trees have never looked better. They're 10 years old. I've been using this product for several years. and. Uh, I think they have really benefited. So because there are no chemicals in here, it's not going to burn. If you drop some on the lawn, it's not going to have a big brown patch. And it's just a great product. If your animals, if your dogs, don't leave an open bag around for your dog to finish it, because that's not good. But if the dog is just sniffing and licking, it's not a problem. I usually just water mine down a little bit, because a typical day like this, it can kind of blow away some of that product. Otherwise, I think it's great. I just have a question. I have a few plants that they are not getting enough iron yellow leaves. Um, and what product do you recommend to get it to green up? Okay, so the question was about uh, yellow leaves in a plant and what would we recommend? Oftentimes, that yellow leaves, which we usually call chlorosis, is from a lack of food, essentially. Right. So this will work fine. You don't have to go and get iron and this and that and other products. I think the first try is just give it the fertilizer and kind of give it a boost to see how it's going to do. And you can do that right now. You can just toss it on the plant, close it down, and you're done. Okay. However, if you do have, um, you've already fed and you're still having that chlorosis issue, and chlorosis is very uh, identifiable because those yellow leaves will have green veins. Um, and we do have liquid iron that you can actually uh, spray onto the leaves and it actually soaks up that way. So if you need a little extra boost, we do sell the liquid iron. It's called chelated iron. Uh, does that work on evergreen also? Absolutely. D for yeah. both, okay. Thank you. Okay, is that good for that? Fertilizer be used on our native juniper trees as well? 
Her question was, is can we use this on natives as well? And you do, you can use it on everything, which is why we kind of call this our meat and potatoes. Um, there's a few other products that we have that are add-ons like the flower power. If you have a lot of hanging baskets, you have vegetables that are you want to keep blooming and fruiting, um, that, that flower power does really well. But this is our meat and potatoes fertilizer. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This fertilizer works on everything in your yard, from vegetables, flowers, shrubs, trees, grasses, anything you want. Uh, plants on your deck, annuals. It works for all of that. Does One the other thing about vary, uh, um, to put in a pot versus in the ground. Say that again. I didn't hear. If you're planting it in a pot versus out in your yard, is the amount going to vary because of the pot? It, it's more of the size of the. <coughs> The, the application is more the size of the plant, so as you apply, you'll, you'll just put, if it's like this cup, a half a cup in there, uh, in a pot, I usually apply it more often, um, because with the watering that you do in a pot, it just leaches out, so anything that's in a pot, I fertilize a little bit more often than the three times a year or four times a year. And does it really have to be worked into the soil, or as you no, say, Johnny, apple seed? Okay, so the question is about working in the fertilizer into the soil. No, it does not need to be worked into the soil. You don't have to till it. Some of us have yards with a you know, landscape rock and, and a blue block under that. It's difficult to work that into the soil. So just the Johnny Apple seed method and a little bit of water to break it down and get it moist and it'll start to sink in and that would be fine. I just, one other thought about watering. I've always seen Paul over here who, his job, and five days a week is to come here and water all day long. And you notice he has the hose and wand in one hand, and he has this little device that's a moisture meter. That's something else that you can consider, uh, because you just put it into the pot and it gives you an idea about whether it's too dry, too wet. Um, all of our, since all of our plants are in pots, they tend to dry out faster. That's why we water more frequently. But also another product, method you can use to test watering is you get these little long bars and you push it into the ground. If, if the ground is moist and has adequate water, it'll just keep on going. If it's dry, it'll stop. So if your tree root is this this far down, and you only go this far down, you know you need more water for that tree. And watering more often, or longer periods of time, less often, is so much more beneficial for your plants than, than watering a little bit every day. Um, when you purchase a plant uh, from us, we, we get, leave, uh, send you away with our planting guide. So it, it tells you step by step how to plant. Um, it also has a watering guide, so it'll give you an idea of what, how, how often to water and how much to water. Um, so you have more information and that's, that's very helpful. Um, see something like this one. Yeah. Um, so now that we're getting in closer to July, there's a couple of things that we need to really, really watch out for. Um, bugs this season, this spring, have been tremendous. Um, so one of the products that you should have in your arsenal is uh, the multi-purpose spray. Um, do I want to tell them about that? Well, this is a, this is a um, concentrate. So it goes best into a sprayer, and it, it's, it's intended to it'll kill over 100 different kinds of insects. So <clears throat> if you have problems and you think a certain plant is being infected or infested with bugs, we have a microscope down there that projects on a computer screen. A lot of times we can see the bugs or we can see there's bug damage, and this is probably what we're going to recommend that you do that. I sprayed this on my roses because there were aphids and thrips and who knows what else. It's just something uh, that happens. And this is a relatively benign product. Um, it's made, yeah, so permethrin is made up of crushed chrysanthemums. It's a right? synthetic crushed chrysanthemums. Um, it's a derivative of the pyrethrin that's actually the natural one. You would spray out on uh, vegetables and herbs. Absolutely. You, this is, uh, you can use it, uh, I think, up to three days of harvest. So it's very safe. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's safe for pets and kids. 
but I would keep them inside when they're spraying. I keep them inside up so everything is dry. It doesn't take too long around here, of course. But I, I tried to, with a couple weeks spraying this when there's a 25 mile an hour wind. I decided no, I want to spray the plant, not me. So sometimes you have to maybe try it early in the morning, late at night when the wind's not blowing. That's so hard. Specific, specific name again? Multi-purpose spray. Mm -hmm. Multi-purpose. Multi we keep saying simple. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-purpose insect control. Yes. My question is about weeds. I feel like always either pulling them and then coming back up. Is there? And it's through the rock. Is there any? Thanks for asking. Yeah, no um, her question was about weeds and um, how to keep them from coming up. Um, we are fixing to go into monsoon season and you're going to have even more weeds than you already have. So this product here is a pre-emergent. Um, it's a granular product that you put down with the grass spreader, hand spreader. Uh, it can go on DG, uh, rocks, uh, mulch, whatever. Um, you water it in and basically it creates a barrier so the seeds that are already in the ground will not emerge. Um, so everything that's up, <laughs> this is not going to help you. Um, but it'll keep all the seeds heads that have been flying around for the last two months from uh, coming back when, when we start getting the moisture with the monsoons. Because you will notice a huge difference with the weed growth as soon as the monsoons hit. So July is a great time to get that down as well as the fertilizer um, because it'll uh, it is high yield turf and ornamental weed and grass uh, stopper will that ruin the soil for um, things that you want to plant no basic unless you're planting seeds uh, it will not ruin the soil if you're planting seeds use something or you want to you don't want to put it on that area but if you have seedlings it, it won't hurt plants yeah. What about dogs? Her question was about dogs. Um, again, water it in. If you've got animals that are going to be in that area, I would definitely take a hose out and get it watered in. Let it dry. All products, you want to make sure you let them dry before you let your pets out. If you apply this and it will kill future growth, um, can a real killer of weeds go on top of it and not handicap it, so to speak? Her question was, is does it prohibit other um, weed stoppers? Uh, anything that's up, basically you're, you're kind of putting a carpet down. Um, so the seeds that are trying to come up aren't going to come up. Anything that's up, you want to hit with a weed killer because they're not going to go away. Do you have a weed killer? We do. We have weed killers down there. Um, they are very organic. Um, we actually kind of, well, I have three different products um, depending on the type of weeds you have. Um, burnout is down there and it's basically citric, uh, citric acid. Um, so it, it basically burns the leaves all the way down to the root. Um, the weed beater is a, a broadleaf weed killer and it works really well. Um, if you have tougher weeds like the whorehound, um, or stuff that has roots like this, um, the, yeah, the, the, the um, brush killer. And we also have the vegetation killer um, down there as well, which is something I, I definitely, some products need to be put down because there are weeds that you can't kill with citric acid. Um, but be safe, you know, wear gloves, wear a mask, you know, wear long sleeves when you apply this stuff, and you'll be safe. Um, go ahead. I'll talk about this after. <laughs> and to just try and answer your question a little bit more, the sprays and the, and the pre-emergent can be used in conjunction with each other, but they're totally different functions. This is going to kill the seeds in the ground, do nothing for anything that's growing on top of the ground. The sprays will kill anything that's growing on the ground. So sometimes it's a two-pronged approach that you have to use, especially, as Michelle said, in monsoon season, a lot of times too, February, the winter weeds can come popping up as well. So usually twice a year is a great time to get that down. 
uh, usually January, February, depending on the year. Um, it's before the weeds start coming up, before we start warming up. Um, and then right before monsoon season, you want to get it down again. And you'll notice a huge difference in your weeds. Just have a question. If your husband buys cheap bird food and it sprouts everywhere, no offense, man. Um, will that kill the seeds from the bird? Yeah, it, if it's a it. seed, yes, it's, if it's a seed, it's a seed in the ground growing up, it'll kill, it'll kill them. Because, you know, some of the sprays they use, they say don't use it around. Well, I, I don't know that I would apply it around where I'm feeding my birds. So if you're feeding birds, it's one of those things you're just going to have to kind of deal with because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> The next thing I want to talk about, because with the monsoon season, um, your fungal issues are going to start popping up. People that have gorgeous roses right now, your black spots going to start showing up. Um, we've already started seeing powdery mildew on things. Um, if you have vegetable gardening and you are growing squash, zucchini, cucumbers, they're notorious for powdery mildew. Um, this Revitalize is a um, it builds the immune system of the plant, so if you start before the monsoon season hits, it, it works on the immune system so the powdery mildew will not happen. Um, if you already have some sort of fungus on your trees or shrubs, um, it, you can use it as a drench or you can spray it on the foliage uh, to um, kill anything that's on the new growth. Leaves that will have a, fo a fungus on them will never change. They're, they're damaged. Um, so it's best to cut them off, pinch them off, get rid of them. Um, if you let them dry up and let them fall, make sure you clean that area. Funguses are soil based, which is why you can use it as a soil drench. This gets in the ground and actually kills the fungus before it gets up into your plant. So. I woke up one day and I, my photinias have powdery mildew. I only have 11 of them and they're all about seven or eight feet tall. So just within a couple days, they all were hit with powdery mildew. So I went and got this and I did the soil drench because you can spray, you can also drench. You don't have to mix very much at all, a gallon of water and I think a one and a half tablespoons maybe. Yeah. So I think I poured in about 12 gallons of this product just the other day. And then as Michelle said, you cut back all the old growth. And this is a product that you probably need to repeat because there's powdery mildews all over town. You see flotinias, you see them more white and powdery on the top. That's what's going on. This is a good product and it's a concentrate. And it says, this is kind of hard to believe, but I looked at the amount. It says it makes up to 96 gallons. So for me, that's great because I have 11 shrubs that are affected. And one is so big, I put two gallons just on that one shrub. And you, know, you may need to do several applications as well. Uh, are mushrooms considered fungi? Like they're growing in my lawn. Would I use that? Or? Uh, yeah, I think you could. I don't know if this mentions, um, it talks, this is really more, more like fruit rot, fire blight, powdery mildew. Not sure if it's going to take care of the fungus. Usually this mushrooms are more from mulch and any tree debris, it, it, usually there's spores on a piece of wood that comes up through the lawn and that's that's where the fungus and because it's been so wet or because you're watering all yes. the time. Um, I was thinking we could talk about some plants. We have some beautiful ones here. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we got some beautiful grasses in the other day. Um, this is a Carl Forrester grass. Um, it's one of the upright grasses. Um, it gets about three feet wide and about four feet tall. So um, it kind of makes a great statement. It gives you a lot of movement and, and, and it kind of naturalizes your, your, your property. Um, they make great border plants or it, it just kind of greens up the, the uh, decomposed granite that we have all over the place. Um, we have all sorts of different types of grasses. Um, maiden grass, which is right behind you. Um, later in the fall, we'll start getting the pampas grass. 
Um, we have some gorgeous zebra grass, which is a green and white striped grass. Uh, so there's a lot of different grasses around that, that'll help naturalize uh, your plants. Uh, this plant right here is a spirea. Uh, beautiful plant, gorgeous flowers, uh, blooms in the spring um, and into the summer. Uh, gets about three by three. Um, a nice little kind of middle-sized shrub. Gorgeous dinner plate dahlias. This is an annual, by the way. Um, but it looks really pretty on the patio. Ah. And <laughs> yeah, this is a bougainvillea, of course, and they're really beautiful. But if you want them to grow on your wall or in the medium strip uh, on the highway, you should probably go to Palm Springs because <laughs> these, these will not last through the winter. They are beautiful annuals and they have nice color. But that's one of the things when we talk about some things will do well here. Roses do great. Bougainvillea does not. These dahlias do not. They're considered annuals, essentially. This little guy here, uh, he's a speedwell. Um, I have two different colors um, down there. This one's a pink one, and then there's a blue one. Um, gives you a little bit of height in your perennial garden, uh, so it's a great thing to put in the backside in front of the smaller things. And this is perennial, it'll come back year after year. I'm sorry, what was that called? It's a speedwell. Speedwell. Should I mention crab apple? Yeah. So to my right is a crab apple. And this is, this is called the Tina Sargent. It's a small crab apple. It's only gonna to get to be about five feet tall. It's a modern grower. It is a, a perennial. And the, the you, most of the crab apples that we have are larger trees. In the springtime, maybe around late March or April, they just have beautiful pink flowers. You see them here when our trees come in. Uh, they're really, really very attractive and they do very nicely here. It is a great tree for a pot. If you have a spot that you, you want something high, um, he, because he stays so small, he's a great tree for a, a large <coughs> pot. Are, they, are crab apples used to help pollinate the, um, like other apples? Yeah. Them together. Um, your question was about that, and I did learn that you can, if they're blooming at the same time, they are a pollinator. <clears throat> well, we have, we have three fruit trees, we're told. you'll get pollination. Um, so if, if, if they're not blooming at the same time, then you won't. Um, and it kind of depends on the apple too, because some apples have an earlier bloom time and a later bloom time. So to go further, we go further onto that subject. <clears throat> Most, if you're considering fruit trees, many of them need a partner to pollinate. So, and we have charts up there because not all of them, like a Fuji might not pollinate a Granny Smith and a Fuji will not, most likely not pollinate a Fuji. Peaches don't seem to need pollinators, but a lot of trees do. And so that's why you look up here and people come in and say, well, I went and bought a fruit tree, you know, a Brand X and it was a wonderful little whip and the trunk was about an inch uh, in diameter. And then, then I learned that I'm not gonna get any fruit because I don't have a pollinator. Well, yes, unfortunately, that's a fact of life. It's too bad nobody told you about that, but maybe we can find one that would pollinate your tree if you know what it is. A lot of times we move in and say, oh, look at that beautiful apple tree. What is it? Oh, I don't know. Well, then how do you know how you can, how you can pollinate that? So we have one more uh, plant that we want to talk about. Um, this little purple guy over here, he is a um, purple, royal purple smoke bush. Um, these guys are one of those smaller trees. He's only going to get about 12, 15 feet tall uh, and about that wide. Um, makes a really pretty statement. statement. Did I do that? Um, so, uh, great color. Uh, it turns gorgeous orange in the fall. Uh, so, it is a great addition to any property. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so we want to open it up to questions. Any issues that you've been having in your garden? Um, her 
question was she had a manzanita and a lot of the man manzanita are dying um, and she's just looking for a plant that can replace it. Um, we do sell manzanita if you want to replace it with another one. Um, we're, we've seen a lot of damage from this year's moisture. It was just way too much. They're not used to that. Um, there was also a disease going through that took out a, uh, quite a few of them as well. Um, so anything, if, if you're on the same drip system, I would stay with something more native that's not going to need as much water. Um, so uh, you could use um, like the potentia, it doesn't, when you plant it, it's going to need a lot of water, but once it's established, once a week is fine. Um, or hopefully you don't have your manzanita on a drip system at all, so you just need to water uh, as you, whatever shrub you put in there, you would need to water. At the beginning. At the beginning. As long as you go with something more native. Yeah. Once they're established, and usually three or four years down the road, then you can kind of cut back on the water. And you don't want to ever just stop. Um, because even if our drought tolerant plants uh, need some help every once in a while. And so you just can't suffer from too much water. So Ours they can. Okay. Except monsoons. Yeah. Japanese maple, do those survive okay? Her question was about Japanese maple, and yes, they do, but they do need some shade, lots of shade. Um, so any protective spot that's out of the wind, if you can, uh, is helpful. Um, if you put them in any type of sun area, they're going to fry around the edges. Um, so try to find a really shady spot with some wind protection. some aspens that have that black, is it black slime? There's a name for it, soot, black soot. Uh, it, it's a disease that they get. Um, so anytime there's an area that you have something going on, I would never replant the same plants in that area. Even I, if a number of years have been high? Yeah. Wow. <coughs> because it can, it can live in that soil for a very long time. Um, find another part of the yard to do it. Um, or, you know, find another tree, like a birch. A birch would work fine in that. I didn't quite hear you, I'm sorry. She's got lavenders and, and other drought tolerant one gallon plants that uh, she was wondering how to water. Okay, well, I'd say that in the first year or two, okay, during that first year or two, I would water them probably once or twice a week for, say, 45 minutes. And then as it becomes established, you could probably cut that back to once a week. And then, then beyond that, maybe once every. Ten days. You have to kind of you could experiment with the amount of water, but as we've talked about, new plants they need water to get established, even if they're natives and drought tolerant, that sort of thing. So, but keep an eye on it because it, it depends on your soil and, and, and how well the drainage is. If you start seeing crunchy, um, I have noticed that uh, lavenders like get really crunchy if they get too much water. So just back it off. Last question. Um, I have a, an area where I want to put a shade tree, but it's close to the septic tanks at the bottom of the hill. And so, um, and it doesn't matter if it's deciduous or whatever, but it, I don't, I only want about 30 feet high, but not deep root, I mean, not a lot of roots. Any suggestions? I, and somebody suggested dogwood and ironwood. Would you, they said they're both about far, but I don't know if those are. So. 
Uh, she's got a, a tree or a place for a tree that is really close to her septic system, and she was wondering what kind of tree. It's also a septic. Yeah. Um, so I definitely stay away from the dogwood. Um, dogwoods here are, is kind of like the Japanese maple. They need some a uh, lot of shade and a little bit of wind protection. Um, they can't go out in that full sun. Um, so if I was you, I'd look for something that's narrow. Um, that's not going to get very wide because um, usually tree roots stay wherever the canopy is. Okay. Um, so if you've got a 30 foot uh, canopy tree, your roots are going to be that 30 foot or more. So go with a narrower tree. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for attending our class. And if you guys have any other questions, Doug and I will be around. So if you want to ask us one on one, we can do that.